So how serious are you about this strike threat? Because mostly it's, it's been threats and threats. Uh, we are serious and it's not a threat because uh, we have given a uh, strike notice and uh, we intend to follow it up because uh, this is the first time we have uh, beseeched the government and given them time to solve some of the issues. The issues bedeviling healthcare began all the way back okay. since devolution and initially we were told to be patient that they are all just, they are just teething problems that would clear with time. But now 14 years later, this teenager is still having teething problems. We are now starting to think that uh, there's something definitely wrong with the healthcare. And uh, we have been telling government that do something around it. In 2017, we had a 100 day strike trying to highlight some of the issues, which ended up with a collectively bargained agreement that was signed by government. Mm -hmm. It is government lawyers who carry the agreement to court, to deposit it as a court order, not the union. And they have never implemented, not even a single clause in that CBA. After that, in 2021, October, we took them to court to sue them for non-implementation and for being in contempt of that court order that they deposited. And the judge ordered them to implement it within 60 days and give back a report. From 2021 up to date is almost three years. Mm -hmm. In December 2022, we wrote for them a letter t telling them we intend to strike because they had not done what they had been told to do in the 60 days. And uh, they met us, the Minister for CS for Health, the Chair Committee for Labor in COG and others, met us and in January 2023 put a matrix of implementation how they are going to implement the issues we raised. The whole of last year we spent nothing but meetings upon meetings on how to solve some of the issues that are causing consternation amongst the doctors. Sadly, over one year later, there was no report. We only finally got a report of this conciliation two days ago after we gave out our strike notice. And even the conciliator appointed by the Ministry of Labor, the conciliator says, implement, you have not done anything. If anything, you owe them almost 2.3 billion even on unpaid salary changes in the basic salaries. So clearly you can see that it is government on a strike. KPD and the doctors are just joining them in the strike. But you know what? Uh, the Ministry of Health uh, under the CS, Nakumi Shawafula, says they have no money. I mean, there's nothing they could, uh, their hands are tied. They have no money. That's why there's going to be a strike to untie their hands. You know, for someone who's just joining us and you said uh, this is, thing started, the teething problem started during the revolution, what are the, you know, like three or four major things that you want changed or implemented? Yeah. Uh, I'd, 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 I'd bundle it in a simpler way that uh, the government lately has been talking about UHC. Mm -hmm. Article 43 talks about the right to quality health care. So the pillars upon which health care is premised on. The first one is that you must have the infrastructure, the hospitals, for seeing the patients. You must have the drugs for treating the patients. You must have the technology for keeping the data, for investigating the patients and all that. More importantly, you must have the human resources. That finally, after they have built both drugs and machines, there must be human beings to make sure that the drug moves from the shelf to the patient. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The human resource component has been mismanaged terribly since the first day of the evolution. Is that where SHIF comes in? Because based on what they've been telling us, this is going to be a game changer. The SHIF, and I thank you for reminding me, that the other component in all this is something called healthcare financing. That somebody must pay for all these things I've talked about. So in SHIF, they have talked about, they, they're trying to fund this process. And as a union, we are still agreed to say that the SHIF will still fail because they have not listened to people. In a country where 20% of Kenyans are on a salary, 80% are in the informal sector. How do you compel the 80% to pay? You can work in countries like Germany where 80% are on a salary. But in a country here, the border border guy will only pay for the insurance when he has a broken leg. Will you tell him to pay for two years, 500 times Prime 12, prime 2 is only 12,000. The cost of fixing a broken leg is 100,000. So it can never work. But that's a story for another day. They f passed the law forcefully. We went to court. The challenge and they won. Let them carry their skunk. Our issue now is that on the human resources for healthcare, we have a serious shortage. And the government is not doing any better by mismanaging it. For example, if you look at our strike notice, number one is the issue around the interns. You know, people don't understand who an intern is. An intern is a doctor who has gone through medical school for seven years, some eight years. They have graduated, they have certificates 
in their bags at home. Mm -hmm. But the compulsory one year period that they have to work under supervision so they can transfer the theory from class and school to practical. So they have a license, interim license to work under supervision. And they don't work near their homes so that you can say they can come from home to work. You randomly ballot so you can be coming from Kisumu and you find yourself in Trukana or Wajia because Kenyans live there too. So you need to have a way of living, paying rent and surviving over there. Yes. Yeah. So then they cannot go for this posting without government giving them letters. There's a policy on internship. We have a CB on internship that A, after 30 days after graduation, they will post you for this mandatory period for one year. Then when you get out, they'll give you a license now to see patients alone. Sadly, we have been waiting for eight months, this is our ninth month, of these young people waiting without being posted, no clear date on the date they'll be posted. They can't do anything. They can't practice. They can't go abroad because they're not yet registered. They can't feed themselves. What do you expect of them to do? And are there many doctors like this? The interns? The interns are 1,219. And they account for 27% of the health workforce because the counties don't employ doctors anymore. So what do they do? They rely on the Ministry of Health to post these interns to plug in the gap. So when you have 1,219 people out that's a significant number of hands that are no longer helping. So this body then shift to the few. In Kenya, we only have like 5,680 doctors working in public hospitals, mm. seeing 55 million. You get that? Mm. So then this group is burdened, carrying a, a burden that other 1,000 people have stepped in to help. That's number one. Number two is that in the, hosp in, in the hospitals, the specialists who have, the doctors have go to school to specialize, to be oncologists, surgeons, physicians, cardiologists, you have to go for an ex extra four, five years. Yes. An example like an oncologist, you only have 100 of them in this country against 55 million. That's one oncologist to 550,000 Kenyans. You tell them that, let these guys go back and master, specialize and come back and help us. Cancer kills, like for cervical cancer kills, nine million every day in this country. Let them go study, come back, specialize. The county releases them to go to school. Minister of Health says that I will sponsor them for school. But when they land in school, they study as they work in Kenyatta, in MTRH, in Eldoret. But school fees are not paid for the last four years. When exams come, they are locked out of the system. They can't sit for the exam. Yet you promise to sponsor them. And then you will end where they are learning, University of Nairobi, or more University, at all government institutions. You tell them, just write a letter to them. Tell you that that government will pay. Let them sit for the exams. They refuse. What about the medical cover? Doctors surrendered their medical allowances. 4,000 shillings per month for some. Some as high as 7,000 in 2011. Give it to government. They take this. Add it to what I pay for in HF and give me a comprehensive cover to cut off all my health needs so that I don't have to worry about my sick child as I treat people. I don't have to worry about my health as I treat people. What happens? Somebody sits and makes this social health act and puts a clause that the enhanced cover end has ended. Tell your employer to get you another cover. You are the employer who has taken it away. Give me another cover. So right now, I'm fundraising for my colleagues. I have a psychiatrist in Indorate who has terminal illness. We are fundraising. Another surgeon in Kericho, terminal illness. We are fundraising. You're being told to go get treated, then bring the receipts, we'll refer when you get money. Where do you get the money from? Yet, I had a cover. So we are telling them that, hey, you have to care for the carer. You have to give us our medical cover. You told us to come to our employer to get the cover. Now we have come to you through a strike. Give us our cover. But and so many other issues. But the worst of them all is the breaking of the obvious labor relations laws. For example, Jeff and Nick, you can work in a department as two doctors. Same thing, same router, same everything. But somebody is put on permanent and pensionable earning 200,000, another person, you put on contract earning 80,000. What's the fairness in that? What's the fairness in you paying people differently? Yeah? And when you make noise, you're terminated. Like for the Nairobi County, Amos, 113 of them terminated. Then the positions are advertised afresh. And you're told, apply. Then when you apply, people start calling you on the side that, uko nangapi utume, upate kazi. The ladies even allege that some of them have been called in hotels for illicit negotiations. That is something that doctors are saying that if not for anything, this strike must bring back the dignity of the practice. But corruption is everywhere, Dr. Ari. Let's face it. It's everywhere. It's not just, uh, you know... But we cannot just say that corruption is everywhere. That's defeatist. Because the kind of corruption that you could excuse 
if you can use lo loosely, is if you steal money for drugs that you have problem with ESCC. But when my salary comes to your account, and you deduct my pay as you earn meant for care, and you don't remit it, you take my money meant for paying the bank the loan, you deduct it and you don't remit it. You take my child's policy for insurance, you deduct it and don't remit it, and the po policy elapses. Then you're now becoming a problem to me. In some counties, doctors are paid salaries one month late. January salary is paid in March. A month in between because that man is somewhere accruing interest before they finally pay you. And we have said this for the last so many years. Nobody's listening. We have told them, please, find even a way of having a centralized way of managing the HR. If governors want to build hospital, well and good, let them give their contractors as a business. They want to buy drugs, well and good, let them get their kickbacks. But when it comes to my salary, please, don't touch it. So who exactly are you speaking to in the midst? Because you sound like you're very passionate and all these, it's like they've been, there's someone that knows about them, but yet there's all these loopholes because I can't understand how money is supposed to leave for salary. They play somewhere in the system, obviously, because someone knows what they're doing. But we have a whole CS in charge of that. Although she hasn't been there for too long, is it the previous regime? You know, all the politicians have been blaming the previous regime. Who exactly dropped the ball? Because at some point in between there when there was a strike, that's when the Cuban doctors came, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So who exactly is dropping the ball and who is in charge of making this change? Like if you strike, this is the person who should make the changes effected immediately. You know, first of all, Nick, uh, when people go to vote in elections, the electoral president, one government. Yes. For the Kenya Kwanzaa, they had a very clear manifesto mm -hmm. on health care. On how they are going to hire healthcare workers that are going to sort some of these things through a centralized management of the human resource. It is in that manifesto. We had an economic convention under healthcare in Catholic University with the pre current president. So the back first stops with the president. Why? Because the Kenya in Turkana, the Kenya in Lamu, the Kenya in Vihiga, when they pay taxes, it goes to the exchequer account consolidated fund in Nairobi. Mm. Counties don't pay us from their market collections. They don't pay us from the sales collections. Counties, the, the, the money that they use to run healthcare comes from the equitable shareable revenue from the exchequer. So, first of all, you have to blame. So, healthcare, as much as it's devolved, is still under the government of Kenya. Because when you can't run, can't run healthcare in 48 different ways. So, I first put the blame squarely in the Minister of Health. They're in charge of policy to make it and implement it, and also training. For only these two functions, they have 143 billion in this current budget. Healthcare is 90% devolved, yet 65% of the money remains in Afia House. You get that? So that's where the first blame starts. Second blame comes in to the governors and the COG. That they can also agree collectively that why can't we look at these other counties that are making us look bad to make things work? Because if Kiambu does not work, Nairobi will pay the price because the doctors will come across. So they have to help each other, make things work. So for us as a union, we have just said that this is a problem to you, the government of Kenya. Whether you are COG, whether you are MOH, we don't care. We just want you to fix the problem once and for all. It's not for me to think of them how to fix it. That's why they're being paid their salary. Yeah? As Kim Pidu, we have cried for the last seven years, from 2017, from 2022. And our cry has fallen on nothing on deaf ears. And the most tragic thing that even after us giving them one year to find a solution the end of last year, today, yesterday, you are being called for a meeting. I've been told, let's start the reconciliation process afresh. We're asking them that what has happened on this report or you don't like the outcome. Because the report was very clear. Mm -hmm. You owe these guys X amount of money. You have not implemented all these clauses. Do it. Now they don't like that report of their own Minister of Labour, now they're saying, no, 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 let's start afresh. It won't happen. It you know, you, happen. you must be the very most patient doctors on the planet because you had a CBA back in 2017, a collective bargaining agreement, two, seven years later. So people are asking, so why now? Why now? In fact, the first CBA was in 2013, which they then disowned and said that the PS who signed it was a stranger. That's why we had a strike for 100 days insisting that they implement it. Once they refused to implement it and we surrendered, they gave us a new CBA. Now they have not implemented it. Now they want another phase. We have only said, why now? Because things are now getting out of hand. This year alone, Jeff, I've lost four doctors to suicide. Because of the frustrations they experience in healthcare. I have a bunch of doctors struggling with alcoholism and drug abuse. Because of the frustrations. And the counties, you know very well, the guidelines in government that 
if anybody has alcoholism problem, you take them for rehabilitation. What do they do? They stop their salaries, worsening the situation. So the, my members are getting desperate. But more importantly, patients are dying because for the acute shortages, when the doctor is not there in hospital, I've had over 105 strikes in the counties ever since the evolution. Who pays the ultimate price is the patient. When mothers will go to Mama Lucy and you have two nurses handling 40 mothers in labor, some of them are going to suffer the consequences. But when they go to the media, what do they say? Dr. Aliwa. They come and fire the med soup, fire the board, but they never fix the problem. So we carry this burden of you are doing killing patients, stealing children, all this nonsense you, you hear them say. Yet they know deep inside that we are not miracle workers. We can only do so much. Yeah. So we say that enough is enough. We are tired of supervising deaths. A hospital without a doctor is a mortuary. You know, when we're growing up, everyone would be like, I want to be a doctor. But no, based on what you're saying, it's like they're, they're, they're devaluing that kind of career because now, surely, if all these 1,000 people come out and they can't even go on with school, I know if they stay out for like a year, year or two before they do that practice, that means if they aren't to, uh, what's the word for, uh, focus on a new... Specialize. Yes, yeah, specialize. It'll take them even longer to, to implement all this. But yet... You, 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 you have these CBAs, which I'm sure if you have the 2013 when they can't back, uh, you know, back track it and implement from there. Who are the people who, when it, the strike is called and then you settle down and then it goes back to how the system was, who's the ones who you, you need to make sure do not bow out to the pressure? A doctor is that special career that when every day you wake from home, your biggest expense probably is taking your kids to a good school to get the best of grades. The second thing you tell them, be disciplined so that you can get a chance in life. So they work so hard all through their lives. Then you go to good schools, and we're so proud of them at those good high schools. Some parents even pay serious money to get those good schools. They score those A's, you scatter them on TV all the time here. Yeah. They're on the front page of the newspapers, we tell them, wonderful job. What do you want to be? A neurosurgeon. And they come to medical school. Patiently wait for seven years reading, we are taught nothing but how to be doctors for those seven years. You finally get out. Eight, one month, two months, eight months down the line, you realize that this country does not honor its promises. Hard work no longer pays. You are being told, like we are told for this current lot in January, that we'll post them in February. Beginning February, you tell them, get ready, you guys are going by the end of this month. Since they are going to different posts and outposts, they go there and start looking for houses, paying deposits. They borrow money from their friends and family, say that I'll pay you back when I'm paid in April. Then the end, February comes and like there's no letters. Then, then what happened? What changed? So then these young people start getting frustrated that out here one plus one is not two. Hard work does not pay. Then I'm gonna have to drag this school captain from Alliance girls on the streets to picket which they don't know anything about. And when you try to pick it, tear gas, people are being shot, people are being hurt. What do you expect us to do? I don't think that any parent out there puts their child through all this so they end up as what they end up with. And that's why some, most of the younger ones are dying from depression and all these things. Because they were never prepared for the politics of life. They never thought that a day would come when a doctor yes. would be subjected to striking. And such kind of indignity. Yeah? So the first thing you have to do when you are doing the strike, the only thing you know how to do, the only thing every worker of the world must do when you are faced with a belligerent employer, you only have to use the power that you have. And the power you have as a worker is the power to withhold your skills and labor. You will not demote anybody. You have no power. You won't stop salary. You have no power. The only power doctors have in this country is a power to withhold their labor and skills. And any time we withhold that labor and skill in form of a strike, does not show that negotiations have broken down. Mm. Does not show that goodwill has broken down. Actually, a strike is the cornerstone upon which the negotiations begin. Because finally now the employer is on the table desperate and the worker is on the table desperate. Now they can both engage to come to a mutually agreed agreement called a CBA that then must be upheld and implemented to the letter. So what happens as of midnight tonight? Our seven-day notice expires today, the 13th day, midnight. <coughs> Come midnight tonight, 
I expect that the doctors would have spent the whole of today discharging patients so that in the morning there won't be any doctor in the hospital. If you see one, probably it will be a butcher delivering meat in a white lab coat. That's the most. That's Jeremiah Karyoki. <laughs> <laughs> this gum boots. Just boots describe just what good. the guy listens to us. Yeah. So let me ask you. Hold on, hold on. So there'll be no doctors performing any jobs whatsoever? There won't, there won't be. Because we, uh, we have also tried to engage them on something called minimum service agreement. It happens all over. That when essential workers go on strike, can they agree on some minimal service? And even one time they were told that they're ordered by the courts agree on a minimum service agreement or what can be done around to save lives because when we strike people die me die and that's what i was going to ask you get that? so yeah. you're yes. when you're discharging people no matter what situation they're in they'll just have to go home they have to go home or even seek the home. icu hdu they'll have to seek care elsewhere so when we t t give them a chance to do the minimum service agreement we give them a proposal mm -hmm. on the minimum we can do during that time mm. they refused the junior doctors in the uk have been striking that minimum service agreement they have not engaged on the minimum self agreement. Every time you do a letter, they don't reply. You give a proposal, they don't do. Just laziness and incompetence. So you took a Hippocratic oath mm -hmm. when you graduated. Yes. And now you're about to see patients die. Does that make sense as a doctor? <coughs> Currently, we're supervising death in those poorly run hospitals, poorly stocked hospitals, poorly funded hospitals, poorly staffed hospitals. We're doing nothing but supervising death. When you work in a hospital where when a mother comes to deliver, the first thing you have to tell her is to go buy drugs across the road. And basins and stuff it, like that. Yeah, so clearly, we are not doing Kenyans any justice. When you work in a country that if you have to have a fair chance at quality health, you have to sell that single cow you are milking, you have to sell that land they are tilling, you have to fundraise in WhatsApp to get care, then it's a broken system. And we are complicit if you continue keeping quiet and supporting such a broken down system. Number two, about this oath. I thought that also saw the president and the politicians also take oaths. This oath only applies for doctors. They also took an oath to care for the Kenyans, to care for the Kenyans. Why can't you first of all challenge them to keep their oath before you come to me to keep my oath? Medicine is a career just like media, accounting and law. It's not a calling, it's a career. Otherwise, if it's a calling, I'd be walking out with a card called calling. And I go to supermarket, I tap calling, and I get money. I tap calling, school fees is paid. But it's a career. And they must just be paid for as any other career. It can't be that when there's money for everything else. Tick, tick, now this year, SS, tick. Curtains, tick. Refurbishment of buildings, tick. But when it comes to paying the worker who carries the ultimate burden, then it's a calling, an oath, a what? Mm -mm. We are not going to accept that kind of gaslighting. That gaslighting is what has put us here, seven years waiting. The life of the patient is not more important than the four young doctors who died from suicide. The life of the patient is not more important than those doctors wallowing from alcoholism, from frustrations in the counties. You get that? Mm. We have to accept that Kenyans must know that the ultimate thing that a leader should do for you is to sustain your life. A road, a bad road, you can walk, you can fix the car when it's broken. A bad school, kids can repeat. But a broken limb means money, you don't grow again. A life gone won't come up again. So we must stop this nonsense as Kenyans of thinking that health and death is so private that you don't talk about it. When the roads are bad, they carry twigs, plant bananas on the road. When the schools are bad, they chase headmasters and, and, and complain about the results. But when a mother dies from lack of doctors or equipment, they say, oh, God plucked the best from the garden. We'll meet in heaven again. God that I serve does not allow a five-year-old to die from diarrhea and a Japanese to live for a hundred years. Ours are sharing competence. And we must know that those smooth roads will only be used by horses taking our bodies home to bury. So we must demand for better health care. And we must join the union in demanding for better health care. Because there's money for everything. So long as you put a political price to that. Politicians only know something that costs them politically. And I hope that this strike, even for anything, will make Kenyans ask themselves that 14 years later, can we revisit this devolution thing and ask ourselves that what has gone wrong? I saw them do the task force on education that came with a raft of measures. I want to beseech the president. Can you kindly make a task force on health and get a true 
picture. The other day, Ministry of Health did an audit of health facilities in this country. Mm. None, zero, met the required staffing norms and standards that they themselves developed. Like, for example, at level four, should have 50 medical officers. Most of them have two or one. And you call it a level four. You hear them launching them. These are level four. These are level five. Level five with nothing. And you are being told that, just keep quiet. We live in a country right now that if, as a mother, who go for your daily wages, washing clothes, probably around for daily wages, a, 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 a guy who has to ride his bike every day to bring food. When at night your baby starts running fever, in the morning you ask yourself that, will I go to the hospital first? And you will kill there the whole day. Or will I go and get the daily wages to feed the others who are left? You choose to go feed the ones who are left. When you come back, your baby is dead. That's the reality that women and families of this nation are faced with every day. To choose whether to go look for money or to kill the whole day in hospital. When you see these mushrooming clinics all over the place, in the slums, in the estates, in the villages, it's not because all of a sudden Kenyans have money. There's something called private for poor. Where you know the public health care system is broken and you have to go to private. You can't, and you can't afford a, private, a proper private. So what do you do? You go to this clinic where the, the dog or the nurse is the owner, is a surgeon, is the accountant, is the front office, is a pharmacist, everything in one, lumped together. And you go there, it's expensive, first of all, because we don't open a clinic because you love patients. A butcher doesn't open a butcher because he loves people. He loves money, he's making money. So this guy with this clinic will open this clinic because he wants to make money. So first of all, it's very expensive. So you have to borrow from all these microfinances you see all over the phone, you have to sell something to go to this place. Over there, of course, it's going to be mismanaged. One person can't be a jack of all trades. Mm. You finally end up transferred out to a public hospital where you get serious shortages. It's more expensive to treat the area you're having. And above all, you are most likely going to lose your life. That is the tragedy that every single Kenyan listening to me here will tell you a story about. That's the tragedy. I'm sure in your phones you have WhatsApp basic groups of people fundraising for hospital bills. Mm. Right now, the biggest, we talk about, guys talk about cost of care. Life is expensive. One of the biggest drivers of cost of life up is cost of health care in this country. The money you spend, treatment, yet only one major illness, I repeat again, is said a lot from poverty. Even me as a doctor, my biggest fear is getting a phone call that my poor mother is sick. Because I know that all my savings will be wiped trying to treat that poor woman. So, and you have been made to believe that the cost of care and the expensive hospital bills are the doctors, they're expensive. Yet research has shown that then, when you're given a bill for a hospital bill, the cost of the worker is only 7%. The rest comes from other issues like taxes, cost of acquiring, running the business. And we tell them, why do you have to charge somebody for diabetes drugs taxes? Zero rated and put the tax on sugar probably. Everybody knows the solutions of what is ailing this country. The only problem which I have come to realize this country is that there are intentional and structural and deliberate effort to crush public health care system, to drive patients to private health care system. The only thing that will stop KMP MDO from striking from midnight is our demands being met. Seven years a long time. Even the Bible, the people who waited and finally had to be set free. I think seven years waiting. Actually, it was almost 21 years because 2013 CBA, they trashed. We gave them a second chance in 2017, they trashed it. So 20 something years waiting. I don't think that you can really blame us. As healthcare workers, as doctors, we don't strike for fun. We don't strike for fun because we come also from the communities that patients come from. We also have sick mothers, sick brothers, and they're also affected when we go on strike. We know the pain that that poor Monainchi has to go through when some of us are out of work. Yet, we are not responsible for their pain. Whoever is responsible for their pain flies out with the fall sick. They have an alternative. It's akin to a mother cooking a meal for their children, for her child. Then when mealtime comes, they eat at the neighbors. Somebody is in charge of your health care, a governor. When they fall sick, they take off. You saw it during COVID of governors who got COVID and survived because they went to private hospitals as their people died in empty ICU beds that they had launched. Mm. You get that? So we have to ask them that if you're going to be in charge of the healthcare, then consume it too. You cannot offer me something that yourself won't take. So let the government come. We tell them that we have always been 
ready to sit on the table. Strikes are not for causing chaos. Strikes are not for issuing threats. Strike is to make them come to the table. This strike was to be gone on Monday. We delayed it for two days to allow them to come up with a concrete plan around how to resolve the issues. We're not asking for anything that we need money for. An example, posting of interns have always been done and they go start work and then after three months you pay them. As a union, we haven't gone to our circle and given every intern a loan guaranteed by us that they can use to start life, then government will pay them in June or July when the, the, the budget is read. On school fees, you have told them. Just write to the universities, the government universities, tell them that this number of people are sponsored by us. We will pay the fees, you have always paid the fees. On medical cover, you have our medical allowance, you see the dating NHIF. Tell NHIF that as we transition, cover these guys for one extra year as we set up a parallel program. On the issue about the basic salary that is owed to us, our debt, just say that, guys, we agree, we owe you 2.3 billion. We can't pay it all at once, but this is the schedule. We are going to spread it across the next 12 months like this. You get that? These are practical solutions you have offered them. But somebody says, my hands are tied. We'll untie it from tonight.